Hi and welcome to my OCR A level biology revision with me Christine. So today's lesson I want to look at transpiration. So transpiration is actually the loss of water vapour from the leaves and stems of a plant. Now it's important to note it's a loss of water vapour. So what we need to understand is how is this water vapour, this gas, lost from the leaves. So it's actually inevitable consequence of gas exchange. So we know that if we looked at the leaves, we know the structure of the leaves and we know that they have stomata that need to open to allow carbon dioxide in and carbon dioxide needs to come in so that the plant cells can photosynthesize. Well, because of that, water will actually evaporate from mesophyll cells. Now, the evaporation of the water is that breaking of the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. Therefore, we need to think back to our water properties and think about the high latent heat of vaporization. So this evaporation from the mesophyll cells will then result in the water vapor being able to diffuse move from a high concentration to a low concentration outside of the leaf. So this gas exchange, carbon dioxide for water vapour, is all due to the fact that the stomata on the underside of the leaves need to be open. So let's just take a step back and think about this. Transpiration is the loss of the water vapour from the leaves and the stem. So if there is any opening that allows for the gas to leave, that is there for transpiration. So the water is brought into the root hair cells by osmosis. Remember the apoplast pathway and the symplast pathway. When we're going into the xylem vessel, it's the symplast pathway. So if you haven't checked out my video on that, please do look back on that one. So once the water has moved in by osmosis, that movement from a high water potential to a low water potential from cell to cell to cell, what you then get is the cohesive and adhesive property of water means that the water will make its way up through the xylem vessel. So remember, the xylem vessel is a dead, hollow, long tube and it is perforated and therefore allows for the water to be moved up through the xylem vessel. The adhesive property, hydrogen bonds between the wall of the xylem vessel and the water molecules, cohesive properties between water and water. So we've got all these different factors of water that are important in resulting in what's known as our transpiration stream. So the transpiration stream is the movement of the water from the roots all the way up the xylem vessel to the leaves. Transpiration is the loss of that water from the leaves. So the water vapour being lost out of the stomata. So let's take a look at this stomata then and how is the stomata open and how does the stomata close? So at different points throughout the day, the plant will either have open stomata or closed stomata. Now that's going to affect the rate in transpiration. So how does the plant actually open and close it? Well, it's actually to do with mineral ions. So potassium ions are actively transported into guard cells. So when the potassium ions are actively transported into the guard cells, what that's going to do is increase the solute concentration. So if we're increasing the solute concentration, we're therefore going to be lowering the water potential. That therefore means that water is going to move into the guard cells down their water potential gradient and as they're moving in by osmosis that's going to make the guard cells turgid. Now the guard cells have a thicker wall on one side of the cell compared to the other and what that does is that causes as the cell gets turgid that causes the cell to end up with this shape which 
opens the stomata. Now, if we go on the opposite side of things, if we want to close the stomata, this is where the potassium ions are this time actively transported out of the guard cells. We're decreasing the solute concentration, raising that water potential, so water's going to leave. Water will leave because it's going to move down its water potential gradient. It will leave by osmosis. As the cells, the guard cells become flaccid, they've lost that water, that causes them to move closer together and to close. So it's important to note, and you'll learn more about this when you look at plant response, is that the plant can actually signal for the stomata to be closed. And that comes down to the hormone ABA. So abscisic acid is a hormone you're going to learn about in module five, plant response. And what that does is that stimulates the stomatal closing. So if, for example, there is severe drought, if the epidermal cells in the roots actually detect that there is not a lot of water, water can't move in by osmosis to the root hair cell, it can't then move through to the xylem vessel, up to the stomata, because it will be lost as transpiration. So therefore what happens is once that severe drought has been detected, the epidermal cells in the root will actually secrete the hormone ABA. So this secretion of this abscisic acid will then travel up the xylem vessel and bind to receptors in the guard cell, therefore causing the guard cells to actively transport the potassium ions out. So what you have to understand is transpiration is a inevitable consequence of photosynthesis if the plant is detecting that there is an environmental concern, that there is some way in which the cells could be damaged, it can actually result in the stomata being closed. So how do we measure this? This is a question that they love to throw at you in the exam. So that you should know that if we're going to measure the rate of transpiration, we're going to do that using a potometer. So what we would do is we would take our plant, our leafy shoot, and what we would then do is we would insert that into a rubber tubing. Now it's important to note that when we insert this into the rubber tubing, we would do it under water to ensure that our column of water has no air bubbles in it. So we always take our leafy shoot and we place it into water before we are going to insert it into the rubber tubing. We want to ensure that there is no air bubbles anywhere within our potometer, except in one place. That is within our air water meniscus. We only want a air bubble at one place because what we're going to do is we're going to measure the rate at which that air water meniscus moves up through a capillary tube. Now it's important to note when you're doing a potometer and you're asked to do the investigation, they will expect you to think about your factors that can affect. So thinking about what's my independent variable, what's my dependent variable, what are my control variables and repeats. So what we always have is we have a water reserve and in that water reserve you have a screw clip and what that means is once you've done it once you can then place it back to the beginning and do it again to get your repeat results by using the water reserve. So by turning the screw clip what that will do is that will allow the water to go into our capillary tube which will push our air water meniscus back to its original position. So a potometer is always used to measure the rate of water uptake and to do that you are looking at the distance that's moved by the air bubble and you are dividing that by the time taken for the air bubble to move that distance. Now normally when we look at this we would measure the rate of water uptake in centimetres over seconds. However, what they love to do in exam is they love to give you an exam question that is about you applying your knowledge but also being aware of the information that's been given to you. So not only do you have to understand that the distance moved by the air bubble 
over the time taken for the air bubble to move, you also need to think about, well, my capillary tube is actually a cylinder. So therefore, I need to understand the volume of my capillary tube. So in a question like this, they will give you all the information you need to be able to do the mathematical calculation. So in this case, they've told me that the air bubble in the capillary tube moves 24 millimeters in 30 minutes. So they've not done it in seconds, they've done it in minutes and they've also done it in millimeters and not centimeters so they've given me some information they then told me the diameter of the capillary tube is 1.5 millimeters what they've also done and this is where you have to be very very careful in the exam i'm telling you that the rate of uptake is centimeters per second whereas the question is asking for it in millimeters cubed per hour so you need to always look at the information that's been given to you and the units they want you to calculate it in. So to work this one out, what you would then do is, first of all, you need to work out your volume of the cylinder, but I can only do that once I know my radius. So I take my radius, which I'm told my diameter is 1.5, so divide that by 2, that will give me that my radius is 0 0.75. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to square that. So if I square my radius, I get 0 0.5625. I now need to put that into my volume equation. And so my volume equation is pi times r squared times the length, the distance, which I was told was 24 millimeters. That will then give me my volume of the cylinder. Now, remember in the question, they've told me to calculate the rate of water uptake in millimeters cubed per hour. So I've been told that that's how far it moved in 30 minutes. So now I need to work out my time. Well, obviously 30 divided by 60 is 0 0.5. So again, my distance moved, so the volume that's moved in the time taken. So my rate of uptake will therefore be 84.8 millimeters cubed per hour. So always make sure in any question that you're given that you take the time to dissect the information. The hints are there. They're expecting you to then apply your knowledge to the situation. And then what they'd say is say, right, okay, how would you plan, for example, an investigation looking at a fact that's going to affect the transpiration. So transpiration was this loss of water vapour. So then I have to think about, well, what could affect the rate at which water would be lost? And remember, we're talking about water vapour, the gas. So the first thing we say is, well, water vapour, this transpiration is an inevitable consequence of gas exchange. So what was the gas exchange caused by? Oh yes, it was caused by light. So if there is a lot of light, if the plant is going to be doing lots of photosynthesis, you would expect lots of stomata to be open. Therefore, you would then expect there to be a higher rate of transpiration because there's an increased number of stomata opening there would therefore be an increased loss of the water vapor. So light can be a factor. Now, light can actually be a factor that would close the stomata if there was too much light, because light, not only do we end up with light, but we end up with heat coming from the sun. So if there's too much sunlight, there will be lots of heat energy, and that could actually result in a drought. So there are other ways they could ask the question. So you have to try and think outside of the box sometimes. But the first thing, if it's talking about light, light, you say photosynthesis, photosynthesis, more carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide, increased number of stomata opening. Now, as I said before, we're talking about light and sunlight we're not just talking about light we're talking about heat we're talking about temperature so if we have a change in temperature if we increase the temperature we would therefore expect there to be an increased rate of transpiration because you've got more evaporation more evaporation more breaking of the bonds that therefore would mean that there is a more kinetic energy in the water vapor therefore they can diffuse at a faster rate increase the temperature, more evaporation, more diffusion, increased loss. 
more temperature, more kinetic energy. So you you want to bring in your GCSE knowledge here and always thinking temperature, kinetic energy. So that could be a way in which you are assessing a factor that would affect the rate of transpiration. So for example, if I were to plan an investigation looking at temperature, I would have my independent variable, which would be five different temperatures. So it could be five degrees, it could be 10 degrees, 15, 20, 25. So that could be a way in which I look at it, but I've not got very big range in my temperature. So I would probably jump it more from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to see the effect of temperature on that rate of transpiration. The other thing that would have an, an effect on the rate of transpiration would be humidity. So humidity is talking about how much water vapor is actually in the atmosphere. Now remember transpiration is the evaporation and diffusion. So diffusion is about that movement of a substance from a high concentration to a low concentration the net movement. So if we have high humidity, that means there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. If there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, that's going to lower the diffusion gradient and that therefore would reduce that movement, that diffusion of water vapor and therefore reduce the rate of transpiration. Now, again, if I were going to plan an investigation looking at this, what I might do is say, well, I'd have my leafy shoot and what I would do is potentially I would put a bag over it. If I put a polythene bag over it, which was clear, that would allow for the light to get through, controlling that factor, but it would then start to increase the humidity within the area. So that's a way in which I could do that. What I could also do is I could use, for example, a fan at different speeds and how wind has an effect on the humidity. Because obviously if there's more wind, that would push more water vapor away, that would increase that concentration gradient and therefore I'd expect the transpiration rate to increase. So whatever they give you as an example, it's important that you think logically, what is transpiration? evaporation and diffusion. So what am I affecting? Am I affecting the evaporation part of it or am I affecting the transpiration or am I affecting the diffusion part of it? So if you like this video then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also if you haven't done so already please do check out my revision platform www.aiqchat.com to help you to revise.